You know, there is so much happening in the life of our church as we begin this new ministry year. This is just another glimpse of what's happening in a new ministry we have that's called Spiritual Care. And you've been seeing these videos and hearing more and more about it. And it's because it's important and it's it's something we've never done before. And so as we seek to be a community that embodies this idea that you are loved, you are loved by God and you are loved by those around you, we have begun to launch a ministry that equips us to do that well. And so there are trainings that we go to to equip people to be caregivers, or even if you're a small group leader or parent or just someone who wants to listen and engage the people around you well, we have these opportunities for you to come into a very structured, very, very high quality environment where you will hear how do you care well how do we listen how do we press in how do we like Jackie said step towards pain the way Jesus did alongside that we'll have one-on-one opportunities for you to come and be heard um, to allow people to step towards your pain we'll have equipping seminars throughout the year around different care oriented issues topics places of hurt but this idea that resonates so deeply with our souls is that we worship a God who stepped towards us in our pain. And as an overflow of that, we want to be a people that step towards the pain of those around us. So you'll continue to hear more about this ministry. And I just want to encourage you to continue to pray about how God has called you to care for those around you, or maybe even scarier, how God has called you to invite people to step towards you where you are hurting and broken. And so along with that, you've heard a lot about what's going on in the life of RCC. We are in a new season, a new ministry year. We had our ministry launch last week where you heard a lot about programs and what's happening. This week, every year, after ministry launch, we talk about Vision Sunday, where it's a little bit of a different Sunday. If you're new, you might ask, why are we not using more Bible verses? There there is Bible in what we're talking about today. This is really just an opportunity for us as a congregation to get a window into where we are going in the new ministry year, to, to look at the vision that we have, how that's going to play out. And important as that is, we also want to look back and see how God has moved in the previous year. We're coming out of a year where our vision is that we wanted to be a people that pray like our lives depend on it. We're moving into a vision where we want to be a people who make disciples as we go. This is a part of, if you've been around for a while, the six-year vision arc that we've been moving through as a congregation. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to look back And we're going to look forward. We're going to look back and celebrate, and we're going to look forward in anticipation. And so let me start by just looking back at some highlights from last year. As we look at what God did amongst our community last year, it's that first slide. I want to look at just some highlights of a year in review. So first, I want to talk about our generosity. Every year, we have a special offering around Christmas that's called Love Shares. And in this offering this year, we partnered with our ministry in Brazil. It's not our ministry. We partner with Bruno and Camilla. And specifically, we funded this initiative that their ministry has where they go into remote, unreached groups in the country of Brazil, which is a large country. It's almost as big as my home state of Texas. I don't know if you knew that. And they would go into these remote areas and they would drill wells so that these people who didn't have water would have water, but also so they had a platform to extend the care of God to people who didn't know him so they can share the gospel and plant churches. Our goal is we were hoping to raise $20,000 and be able to build four wells with that $20,000. That's $5,000 a well for you math people. Glad I could help you. If you know me, I can't add. That's why it's funny. We actually brought in a little bit over $30,000. And so above and beyond what we had planned or hoped, through your generosity, we will have multiple wells dug in Brazil, potentially with opportunities for us to join some of those trips short term, we'll see. But an unbelievable movement of your generosity that has fueled massive, massive opportunities for people to know the love of Jesus Christ. I stood up here last year. Um, I had just gotten hired as your lead pastor. And one of the first things I did in Vision Sunday was ask you for more money because we were looking for a new staff person, which was super comfortable for me. Felt good. If you remember, we said we are looking for a full-time student minister because Michael Panyard had faithfully served in that role part-time um, for six years. And then as a volunteer, I think for six or seven years before that. Um, 
Michael was actually Jay Street's youth leader. That's how long he's been doing it. <laughs> let, you think about, let you think about the math there. And so Michael had come to us and said, hey, I feel like God's called me to step back and really focus on family. My kids are getting older. Um, th there's a need in this ministry that I can't meet and be faithful to who God's called me to be at home. And we started a process with a search team of um, Anna Sturkey, Sanjit David, myself, Shiona Daniel, um, and Morgan Chalk. And we searched and searched and searched and we had Zoom call after Zoom call after Zoom call and patient families in times of discouragement and times of elation followed by times of discouragement. And as a lot of you know, um, we were able to hire Josh Davidson. Josh and his wife, Sydney, and their son, Paxton, came to us this spring. And this is an answer to prayer beyond what we could have expected. God has been good to our church and has gifted us, the family of the Davidsons. And I cannot express to you how much God moved beyond our expectations for this role. Um, as you heard Libby talk, or if you've talked to any of our students and have heard anything about the impact that the Davidsons has already had to our congregation, I can't overstate to you the gift that they have been to us. And we are so thankful that God has brought them. This is not a small answer to prayer. This is not something that we take lightly. This is a deep deep blessing to our church. Alongside that, we also hired Lauren Becker to be our spiritual formation director, which is a new position that we created at the church. And the Beckers have already been a gift to our family, but there has been an instant change in the life of our church and our ability to connect people into formational practices in the very short time that Lauren has been with us. And so I'll tell you, it's, it's hard for you to always feel the depth of the impact because, you know, a lot happens during the week and, and we've all got stuff to do. And it's easy to miss the way that we are blessed as a church by the people that God has brought to shepherd us. Lauren and Josh, thank you. <laughs> Sydney and Jonathan, thank you. Paxton, thank you. Becker, children, all of you, thank you for sharing your parents with us and your spouses with us. We are being shepherded and led by unbelievably faithful men and women who deeply love the Lord and deeply love you. And God loved us well by bringing us these people. I don't want to skip over the opportunity we have to celebrate his goodness and how he has brought people to love us well. We had four congregation-wide prayer experiences last year. Obviously, we prayed other times, right? Like, this weren't, these weren't the only times we prayed. If you're new, you're like, you're on prayer. You only prayed four times. It doesn't seem like that's good. You would be correct. But we do want to recognize that we had four opportunities to stop and pray, not just to the Lord, but pray with each other to the Lord. There is something about praying in community that I think reinforces the depth of the spiritual reality that is at work when we go to our Heavenly Father. And so we want to look and recognize that we have these opportunities that will continue in the new year. It's not like, okay, prayer year is over. We don't pray anymore. That's not what's happening, right? But we want to recognize that through these four experiences, we set a foundation of being a people that are drawing near to God and growing a hunger to do this together more often. We had 35 students that went to our summer camp or student retreat. This is a big deal in the life of a teenager. Um, so many of us know how deeply formative those experiences were in our life. And we wanna be a church that loves the children that God has gifted as well. In the same vein, in the past calendar year, there's roughly 20 new babies that have been born here. And so God is continuing to bless our families with these opportunities to love his children that he has given us. He has given these children as a gift to parents. He's also given these children as a gift to our community because one of the realities we believe about how God has called us to live life as a church is that we don't live an isolated life that is sheltered from other people. Some of you are laughing right now and I'm nervous as to why, so I'm gonna fight through that. <laughs> we are a church that does life together. And so these children are a gift to all of us. It's just like we practiced in child dedication, we all have a calling and a responsibility to pray for and come alongside these children and their families so that we can deeply love them and show them that they are loved by their Heavenly Father. 
So we want to go to the next slide. I want to spend some more time in the year in review a little bit. We don't get to see the children's ministry in here very much, unless you serve back there. And if you don't, you should. Um, and if you see these numbers, you'll see it's because we literally need you to. So I just want to recognize what is going on in a place in our church that is vitally important that's really easy to miss on a Sunday. So Shiona gave me kind of our forecast for about how many kids we'll have in each area at the start of the year. The nursery is going to grow a little bit. Um, but in our nursery, we have seven young souls that we are nurturing, praying for, reading scripture over, discipling. We don't want to do child care. We, we want to pour into and disciple these young hearts and minds to understanding who Jesus is. And I just want us to get a window that this number seven is easy to look over. These are seven lives. These are seven lives who God is going to call to himself. Is going to call into a unique gifting and wiring. They're going to have these wide breadth of experiences and impact on the world around them. And we have the privilege of nurturing them from the very beginning of their time here on earth. We have 12 toddlers. It's a lot. If you've ever been around a toddler, 12 at once is a lot. Um, we have 12 small people who are learning for the first time. What is the Bible? Who is Jesus? What is God? What does this mean? Why am I here? Um, we have 15 three- and four-year-olds. We have 20 K through first graders. I want you to look at the number on second and third grade because it's a little higher than the others. We have 29 second and third graders in the life of our church that are waiting in this new phase of development that starts to happen in your brain about eight to grow in their understanding of what it means to know Jesus Christ. We have 15 fourth and fifth graders that preteen age just can't wait for what's next that are starting to ask questions about who am I apart from my parents? Who do I want to be? What defines me? What makes me worthwhile? Where do I belong? Those questions start in fourth and fifth grade. We have 15, 15 people that we have the opportunity to pour into. So this isn't a scoreboard. It's not like the bigger these number are, the more that God loves us. That's, that's actually not how it works. This is just a reminder of how God has blessed us. When you look at the children he has gifted us, we don't want our kids to be an afterthought. We don't want it to feel like drop them off at childcare and come in here where the real stuff happens. This is an incredibly vital part of our church. And one of the ways that Jesus modeled the love of the Father for us in the New Testament is that he had a love and care and attention for children. Our children matter to God, so they should matter to us. Even if you do not have a child back there, because you are a part of our community, you have children that God has called you into responsibility for. Welcome to community, right? Like there's a weight that we have as a church to love these children well to show them that they are safe and that they are known and that there is a Father in heaven who loves them as much as their parents here on earth do, if not more. And so as a church, I want us to recognize one of the places that God has blessed us and moved that we can forget because we see it every day is that he has entrusted us with these lives. He's entrusted us to shepherd and nurture them. And man, it can be difficult to hear people um, on Sunday morning in the lobby because this blessing is in its full bloom. <laughs> but I think that the noise and the energy and just the frenetic pace that happens when they are unleashed is a beautiful reminder of the way that God has blessed us as a church. And we want to continue to be a place that is known for how we love and that's going to express itself very clearly in how we love our children. And so I want this to be a part of how we look and say that God has been good to us because he has given us these kids. So as we, look, as we continue, I want us to kind of shift into some more of the practical. Now listen, I'm going to be really honest with you. I don't like to talk about money in church. It feels very righteous gemstones, kind of makes my skin crawl. Um, because the reality is, unfortunately, from pretty much the Old Testament, when you read the prophets and how religious officials were misbehaving, money has been a place that church has gotten weird. Can we just agree with that? And we don't want to be a place that lets money get weird, okay? But it's not who we are. That's not who we want to be. The flip side of that is God has talked about money. There's a spiritual reality to money. There's a practical reality to money. And we've been called to be generous. And so we want to be appropriately transparent with our finances. 
We also want to be upfront that your generosity matters. Where you are generous, God uses that. So last year, we had, um, this is a rough estimate because our giving year closes out in, in August. And so there's a couple more months left this year. But as a rough estimate, if we can do our best, don't worry. I did not do the estimating. Other people do that. We will have our, our giving come in at about $672,000. Our expenses were $693,000. And there's an additional income that is right around $30,000. Like, what is that additional income? Are we selling things now? No. Um, this is income that comes from where we've rented out our space to some other organizations that have used it, whether that's for rehearsals or um, just a space for some meetings. This is also the way our budget's currently set up, a reflection of when you pay for a retreat registration, it shows up in a separate income line. We may change that next year um, for reasons that are very technical and I'm happy to have that conversation with you now, but just for the sake of clarity, this income is just where you've registered for things and where people have rented our space, right? So the great thing about this, and here's what I want to celebrate. When you do the addition, which is not easy for me, but when you do the addition here, here's what you see. God provided exactly what we needed. And we said this last year, do you remember? God provided exactly what we needed. This is a reminder that we have a God who is a God of enough. He gives us what we need. God provides because he is good. And through your generosity, in the last budget year, God has provided. He has provided a budget that has kept us stable. He has provided a budget that has kept us um, from digging into our savings. He's provided a budget that's allowed us to be generous and send money around the world and around our community. And so thank you for your generosity. Thank you for being a people who take seriously the call that God has given out of our money. And here's the other caveat to this, because I don't want you to hear what I'm not saying. Listen, you giving more money to the church does not make you a better Christian. It doesn't make God love you more. It doesn't give you any sort of preferential treatments. You don't get more say the more that you give. We don't have um, luxury seats here, okay? And so I don't want to miss that, because there's times in our life where we're not able to be generous, and it's, it's difficult to be in a place where we can't give. There shouldn't be guilt and shame over that because that's not what God calls us into. And so I really want to fence and guard some of the places that this concept of generosity has been abused by the church. Um, I think there's a lot of evil that seeped its way into the church, which we shouldn't be surprised about around money, and we don't want to do that. And so there shouldn't be guilt and shame around this. This would simply be a celebration that we have a God that provides what we need. And you as a congregation, through your love of the Lord and the love of our community, has been generous. And I want to celebrate that, and I want to thank you for that. And I want to encourage you to continue being obedient in that as we wait and anticipate what God is going to do in the next year. So let me give you a little bit of what we're thinking for the 2024 budget. Our elders officially approved this yesterday, which is a little more last minute than I'd like, but that's kind of just how we roll sometimes. And so um, the rough number that we have, it's not rough, it's exact, is 783,516. Um, now, Every year, when you look back at our budget, we actually spend significantly less than our budget. And that's because we have ministry leaders that do a great job of matching what we spend with what's coming in. But to fully fund what we have in front of us, this is the budget that we've targeted. Um, our facilities budget, these are the big chunks because you're like, man, that's a lot of money. What do you guys do with all of that? Um, that's an important question because... Sometimes those answers in some places are not what you want them to be. So here's, here's where the majority of it goes. I want to talk to you through big chunks of this. This feels very unspiritual. I promise it is because we want to be very good stewards of your worship. Um, $275,000 goes into our facility. So that is our rent. That is our utilities. That is when things break, like air conditioning or doors or the internet. Um, all of that goes into our facilities, paying off the build out that we did. I believe there's some of that still. I'm not sure. No, there's not. Okay, good. Um, so all of that is covered by this. And our rent's a significant part of that. Um, missions, we are giving away um, just under $60,000 a year. Those go to our four global mission partners as well as our local missions. Um, this is a number that we always want to get bigger. And this is actually the biggest single increase we did in our budget this year was to our missions line item. We increased all of those by 25%. Um, we hadn't increased our missions giving in a bit. And so we went ahead and said, we want to make this a priority. We want to be a church that reflects God's generosity. And so that's, that's been the biggest budget increase increase um, in the year. And then 
the largest chunk goes to personnel. And the reality is, and we'll talk about this in a minute, um, our ministry is enabled by people who work very hard here. Um, and we do want to pay them. Um, we want to provide them fair compensation for our full-time employees. We want to be able to take care of their health insurance. And so this is the biggest chunk that we have and just a reality of kind of behind the scenes church mechanics. The smaller a church is, the higher a percentage of the budget the staff is. Um, generally, the bigger a church gets, the more that kind of shrinks down, or at least it should. And so that's how we budget. That's how we think about that. Listen, if you have any questions about this, please come talk to an elder. Uh, Morgan Chalk is our treasurer. Um, I don't want to give you more work. I just, you know, you can count. And so you're a better person to talk to than me. Um, you can talk to Jay Street is the chairman of our elders. Peter Beck is one of our elders. Clark Collins is one of our elders. I would encourage you to always talk to them. They're fun to be around, but specific, talk to me. We don't hold this secretively. We, we don't want to be furtive about our money. We want to be very upfront. Um, your generosity is your worship, and we are entrusted to steward that worship for the advancement of God's kingdom. We want to answer those questions well, and we want to be able to invite you into generosity appropriately. Listen, we're not going to talk about money all the time, but when we do talk about it, we want to talk about it well because it is important. Does that make sense? We good? Okay. We can move past the money. Is everybody feeling better now? Whew, it's exhale. Um, so this is where we're at. So let me talk about staff for a little bit. One of the questions that I got on a surprisingly regular basis last year, um, my first year is, so who works here and what do they do? Like how many people are actually on staff? And I asked around a little bit and people are like, yeah, that's always been kind of a mystery. So we've had some staff transition over the last year. Um, none of it's been bad. It's all been very good. Everyone who has left staff um, continues to attend our church and they just phase and season of life, they could not have a part-time job with us and a full-time job in the world. <laughs> and so um, as we have encouraged people to take steps towards health, we have filled some of those roles. I understand I've been told that the typeface is a little bit small on this. There were a lot of pictures that I put on here, so I, I wanted to make the, the writing bigger. Um, so here's just a window of who is on our staff. Um, I'm obviously on our staff. I'm our lead pastor. Um, my name is Nick. And so I preach, I, I counsel, I meet with people. Sometimes I change light bulbs. So really whatever you need me to do, I'm here for you. You let me know. Okay. Here's the other kind of scope of what we have. And I got to tell you that there's not a day that I come here and spend time with these people that I'm not thankful to God and how good he's been to me by getting to work with these people and how grateful I am when I'm around our community. This is a huge reflection, I think, of our heart's community, our community's heart. So Stephen Owens is our facilities manager. Stephen is a part-time, part-part-time employee. Um, and so Stephen is responsible for everything in our building. That doesn't mean he's necessarily the one doing it, but he finds the person to do it. So don't ask him to fix your plumbing at your house, um, but he maybe can tell you who to call to do that. I don't know. And so Stephen helps us manage all of our building and connections. Um, he, helps, he helps with the interior of what things look like when it's time for Christmas decorations or Easter. Stephen is the guy that is leading that. Um, when it is managing our warehouse storage space in the back, Stephen is the guy to do that. If you need someone to give you permission to throw things away that you don't need anymore, I can highly recommend Stephen as a guy to talk to for that. Um, so Stephen, we're super grateful to have you there um, and has just made this place being an environment that we can come into and worship and take care of um, much, much easier by having Stephen on that. I talked about Lauren a little bit. Lauren Becker's our spiritual formations director. Lauren's also part-time. Um, that'll be 20 hours a week in the new budget year. Um, the reality is it's often more than that, but um, in theory, it is 20 hours a week. And so Lauren is really responsible for all of the ministries that are forming our people, that are helping us grow. So when you think about groups, men's ministry, women's ministry, um, spiritual care, those are really the primary spheres that she gives oversight to. And so she works with the leadership teams of all of those ministries and kind of helps them um, get what they need to know a little bit around clarity, around mission and vision, helping craft budgets, um, helping really with everything that that entails. And so it's a huge job. Um, she also meets and counsels people all the time. And so this is a very important role. We're very grateful to have her in it. Um, so it's a little bit of a new role. In the past, we, have a Dave, we had David Wilhite as our groups director. Um, but as we looked at everything that we do as a church, really spiritual formation felt like a more appropriate scope of what that role does because there's a lot going on here. You, you heard announcements. 
Um, we have Priya David, who's our worship director. You guys get to experience her leading worship on a weekly basis. Um, so just giving oversight to our team of volunteers, um, helping make sure that the production is working and happening. Um, all of that is under the purview of that worship director position. So Josh, I talked about, is our student and connections minister. And so the student minister part, I think most of us are fairly literate in what that means. Our Wednesday night programming for our 6th through 12th graders, retreats, missions, those leaders, um, the volunteers, all of that Josh gives leadership to. He also leads our connections ministry, which maybe you're like, what does that mean? So if you've been new, if you've been new here at our church, you've gone to hopefully a newcomer's event. Hopefully someone's talked to you and explained to you who we are and what it looks like to get involved here. All of that is what we call connections. How do we help people come in and become a part of our community? And so we're already seeing the fruit of Josh coming in. This is a big part of what he did at his last church. And so you'll, you'll, you'll see the beginnings of a newcomer connect center in the back right hand corner of our lobby. So there's a place for you to go and get information and help with anything you need. Um, our newcomer events, our membership process, all of that is sort of under that connection sphere that Josh does. All of these job descriptions obviously are bigger than the things I'm telling you because there's just things that happen and we deal with them too. So Shiona Daniels, our children's ministry director, I talked to you guys about children's ministry already. Shiona gives oversight to all of those volunteers back there. Um, the worship environment back there. One of the most powerful new shifts we had last year in our kids' ministry is there is almost every week live musical worship that's happening, and that's a team that Shiona has begun to build and initiate. This year, she's taking a new step of actually writing the curriculum for our children's ministry, so our kids are hearing the same things that we are, and as a church, we're walking through the same topics and values together, and she is also um, insanely creative, and so most of the art and graphic design you see back there, she actually does a lot of that by hand. She would never tell you that, but she's very, very talented at it, and so um, really, she is almost just perfect designed for this role because she has a creativity, a love for our children, and a love for our adults that just has made our kids' ministry a place where our kids do know that they are loved. Um, Brian Elder is our volunteer coordinator. He helps make sure that we have volunteers scheduled in the right places at the right times and that, that there are people there to do the things that we need them to do. He also does a lot of other things, um, so he's very much a utility back. Last but not least, Steve, not least, Steve Heimler is our adjunct teaching pastor. And so Steve is, if you've ever heard him, you know, an incredibly gifted teacher. Um, and it is a good thing for our church to have multiple voices from the front. And we are incredibly blessed to have Steve, who has been in ministry, has gone to seminary, and is unbelievably talented at communicating the truth of God's word, available to us to come and help us understand who God is from his word. And so he has been an incredible blessing to our church. Um, he's been an incredible blessing to our community, not just because of what he does, but because of who he is. In the context of his staff role, we get to experience who he is through his teaching gift. And so we are incredibly grateful to Steve for everything he does. So th this is who works here. This is, this is who we are. This is what we do. Um, we have two positions that are not listed here. We have two virtual administrators um, that we've contracted with about 10 hours a week. And they help keep our website kind of online. They actually remote in and build the slides that you see with the worship lyrics and the sermon notes and do a few miscellaneous things like that. Um, and so that's a huge help to us as a staff. We try to be flexible. We try to be very lean and we try to be really good stewards of the budget that we've been given. And we also want to bless and take care of these people as they're unbelievably faithful to what God's called them to do. So this, this is it. This is a snapshot of that. Um, again, any questions you have, man, please come talk to us about it. But we want, we, just, we want to give you a picture. There's been some moving pieces in the last year. And so this is our staff. So that's a very quick snapshot of where we've been. Let me talk to you a little bit about where we're going. We're moving into a new vision for this year. Our vision is that we will be a people who make disciples as we go. What does that mean? What does it mean to make disciples? What is a disciple? A lot of us hear the word disciple and we think of Jesus' disciples, right? There are the 12 disciples. Well, what is a disciple? A disciple, by definition, is someone who follows a teacher and is shaped and formed by their teachings, not just in their head, but with their life. 
And so when we talk about being a disciple of Jesus, we are talking about being a people who are shaped by his teachings, not just with what we know, but with how we live. The last command that Jesus gave the church before he ascended into heaven was to go and make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So this is not a gray area. Jesus was very clear about this. As a church, we believe that Jesus was the Son of God, that he was fully man, fully God, the second person of the Trinity, and that there is an authority in the words of Jesus because Jesus is God. And so when Jesus says, go and do this, we take that seriously. As a church, our vision for the year is that we, we would be a people that make disciples as we go. The reality is all of us are being discipled all the time. As humans, we are built with a desire to be formed and to grow into what we value in worship. And so when you kind of zoom out and look at just cultural reality, you can see all the fruits of discipleship, right? Like people are discipled by advertising. There is a reason that people all tend to look and dress the same, right? Ironically, often as an expression of their individuality, but that's another thing. But like, listen, we, are, we wear what we wear for a reason. There's a reason we don't do the togas anymore, right? There's a reason that people pay $300 for a pair of sneakers. I'm not knocking that, but there's a reason we do that. We've been discipled into learning that that's a value that our life, life should be shaped around. There's a reason that we do what we do for entertainment. There's a reason that our houses look the way that we do. We've been discipled by Instagram influencers and HGTV, right? Like there are people who shape the way our lives live. That is the gravity of humanity. It's not a question of if we're being discipled. Our lives are being shaped by something. No one's life is shaped in a vacuum. You, you can blow the horn of individualism and self-determinism all you want, but at the end of the day, somebody taught you to do that. We are all discipled and formed. As a church, we want to be a people who are discipled and formed by the teachings of Jesus Christ. We want our lives to look like the life of Jesus. We want to love what Jesus loved. We want to worship what Jesus has taught us to worship. We are going to be formed by what we worship. If we are worshiping God, we will be formed by God. And so we want to take this seriously. We want to be a people whose lives look like Jesus's. We don't want to be a community that comes and takes in some information and then goes back out into our life. We don't want to be a people that sees what we do here as a form of life coaching or life improvement or, or here's five steps to be an upper middle class American. That's not actually the goal of Christianity, right? Like it's not. We don't want to be a people that have been primarily discipled by consumerism, by capitalism, by cable news, Fox or NBC. I don't care. Whichever one makes you feel Feel better. Like, we don't want to be discipled by any of those things. We want to be aware of what is shaping us, and we want to repent and walk away from anything that is discipling us to be anything other than Jesus Christ. We want lives that look like Jesus. And so our vision for the year is that we would be a people who are intentional in our practices. What are we being formed by? What are we forming and reproducing? What are we worshiping? And so we've actually been talking about this as elders since January of 23 and as staff since probably about March. And as we drilled into making disciples as we go, here's what we did. There's really three targets. So how do we know we're doing that? How do we know if we're making disciples? What does that mean? Here's what we walked away with saying. If we're going to make disciples, we're walking three directions. This is Vision Sunday. Where are we going? There's three directions we're going as a community. We're going up, we're going out, and we're going in. If we want to make disciples and we want to be formed, the first place we have to go is up towards an understanding and love for who God is, right? Otherwise, this just turns into moralistic therapeutic deism. Be really good and be better, and if you can do that, then God's going to help you have a good life. That's not what we're doing. What we're doing is seeking to know and love the person of God. The more that we see who he is, experience his goodness and holiness and love, the more that we dwell on his perfection and holiness, the more our hearts will be shaped to desire that for our lives. We'll always worship what we think is good. So we want to dwell on the truth of the goodness of God. 
So we want to go up. We want to be a people in the next year as we make disciples to always root ourselves in the reality of who we're being discipled by. Do we love God more than we love anything else? Do we grasp his glory and his goodness, or do we kind of take that lightly? Do we dwell in gazing on the levels of depth of the perfection of the goodness of God? Or is it like, oh, that was a good song. All right, well, let's, let's go to lunch. We want to be a people who continually fix our gaze on the truth of who God is. We want to go up. So we're going to be very intentional as a community this year that we are going up together and focusing on moving towards the person of God. Second place we want to go is in. Are we caring for the people that God has entrusted us with? Are we taking care of the people that God has put in our lives? When we look at Jesus, one of the defining characteristics of Jesus is the way that he loved and cared for people. One of the hallmarks of who Jesus was is that he healed people, right? You don't heal people if you don't love them. One of the defining characteristics of Jesus is that he saw people that had been marginalized, that had been rejected, and he showed them that they were accepted by God. The reality of Jesus is Jesus cared for people. If we want to be disciples, if we want our lives to look like Jesus, we got to care for people. So who has God brought into our community? We want to care for them well and effectively. And so our target for this, this is the word that we use as objective, just because we want to think about, are we doing what God has called us to do? So these are going to be three areas that you'll hear us talk about a lot in the next year. We want to be intentional around creating a hub of care. Are we a church that is effective in caring for people? Are we walking towards pain well? Our spiritual care ministry is a huge part of this. We also are working very hard to build out an effective benevolence ministry, a congregational care ministry. If people need anything, do they know where to go? If people need help moving, if people need help with bills, if people need help with medical issues, if people need help of any kind, are we a place that is caring for the people that God has put in our way? We don't want to be about entertainment. We don't want to be about growth for the sake of growth. We don't want to be about acting like we're better than other people. We want to be about living the life that God has called us to live. So to do that effectively, we want to be a church that prioritizes creating a hub of care. If you need care, where do you go? How do you know it's safe to ask for help? How do you experience people meeting your needs? <clears throat> It's not unspiritual for us to meet practical needs. I love the picture of Jesus at the woman of the well because he kind of does both, right? He gives us a picture of how God meets us in our spiritual and practical needs at the same time. And James, the book of James, does a beautiful job of expounding on this. Our works don't save us, but our good works are an overflow of the faith that has saved us. It's okay for us to do good works. It's not evil. Ephesians says God actually created us to do good works. It's good for us to do that. So we want to create a hub of care. One of the ways that we want to make disciples is we want to be a people who are caring well for those around us. And we want to have good systems in place to do that. I know that doesn't sound spiritual, but messy, disorganized church that misses those that are hurting does not feel spiritual either, does it? We want to be a church that is effectively caring for our people. The third place we want to go is we want to step into proximity with those outside our walls. So I think one of the obvious ways that we make disciples is by making new disciples. Are there people who don't know Jesus? Are there people who don't know what it means to follow him or have a skewed idea of what it means to follow him? Do we know who is around us? And listen, this is kind of loaded um, because just kind of some of the fruits of some of the darker sides of what you've read about Christianity recently is you can skew too far, far towards growth for the sake of growth, right? You've seen the place like, we're going to go to a whole nother level. And like everything is about more, more, more. We want more people. We want more, more, more. Um, church is really for the people that aren't here. Well, no, biblically, it's, it's for the people that are here. It's also for the people that aren't. It, it's not one or the other. And it seems that everyone has a temptation to go to one extreme or the other, where they're so inwardly focused that they miss those that are outside the church, or they're so outwardly focused and so mission focused that they don't care for the people that are in the church. 
The reality is we're called to do both. Making disciples is not a neglect of developing those who have come to faith. Making disciples is also not a neglect of the command that Jesus has given us to share the gospel. You don't have to choose one. Just kind of the way people are, though, we usually choose one. <laughs> and the one that we choose is always the more important one. That's just human nature. But as a church, we don't want to do that. We want to go up. We want to go in. We also want to go out. So how do we go out? Here's, an, here, here's kind of what this looks like with skin on it for us. This is local and global missions. How are we going into the community of Roswell, of the North Atlanta metro area, and sharing the love of Jesus? And like, you know that there's already some glimpses of this that you've heard, right? Like we work with Hope Roswell for their Day of Hope. It's a coalition of churches that meets the underserved. We worked with Must Ministries, which is a, a food pantry ministry. Um, you heard Brick talk about the new mentoring program that we have in Centennial and Roswell High School, right? Like you've heard a little bit about some of this. We want to continue to be a church that steps outside of our walls. We cannot say that we love God and not love the people around us. We can't say that we love God and miss those that have been oppressed by injustice or marginalized by society or just simply don't have enough to eat. We can't do that. We can't be those people. We have to be a people that goes out. God's also given us, I think, a responsibility to use what we've been given to go into other parts of the world and to step into proximity with them. That doesn't mean we're the saviors. One of the hallmarks of our mission strategy is that we work with local indigenous groups that are already on the ground to come alongside them. Not to come and tell them what to do, not to save them, but simply serve them and partner with them. And so in Hungary, in Uganda, in Southeast Asia, which she is safe, right? Um, in Brazil, we wanna come alongside existing indigenous ministries and partner with them and serve them. So we wanna be intentional about this as a church. We are going to invite you into proximity with hurt and pain, with oppression and injustice, with, with the darkness of a broken world so that we can shine the light of Jesus Christ in those places. We can't make disciples if we're not stepping towards people that need to be discipled. That doesn't mean we're choosing between the people that are here and the people that are not. It means we do both. And I think as a church, we have a massive opportunity to step outside of our walls in a way that, frankly, we haven't been able to because of COVID-19. Remember when that happened? <laughs> Made it very difficult to do anything. As the world's opening back up, we want to make sure that we open back up too. And so in the next year, really, you're going to hear us talk about these three directions quite a bit. We're going to talk about going up, we're going to talk about going in, and we're going to talk about going out. And the reality is, you're going to feel a pull towards one of those more than the others. And hear me say this, that's okay. That's okay. If you try to do everything, you will burn yourself out with busyness. But God's probably calling you to do one thing. And that's good. So as we continue walking towards this idea of making disciples as we go, the question that, that I want you to ask is, where is God calling you? Um, so here's the last one, and I'm going to wrap up because I've gone really long today. Um, what does a disciple look like? There are seven rhythms of discipleship as elders that we talked about. This does not mean this is the scope of everything that we do. This doesn't mean that we don't do other things, but there's seven things we do. This is a picture of what a life shaped by Jesus looks like. And we're going to talk about this. Our next two sermon series in the fall before Advent are going to be these rhythms of discipleship and then spending a lot of time in the Gospel of John. And so as a people, this is the, these are rhythms. What does our community look like? Who is RCC? We want to love people. We want to live in community. We want a Sabbath. God's commanded us to rest. We're people that need to rest. We want to study scripture. We want to pray. We want to share the gospel. And we want to be generous people with everything that God has given us. And we'll talk more about these in, in, the, coming, in the coming weeks. Um, but just when you think about a disciple, it's such a nebulous term. What does that look like? What does that mean? This is what we believe it looks like at RCC. Because at the end of the day, we're a people who are truly defined by this idea that you are loved. You are loved by God and you are loved by the people around us. And so this morning, we are gonna respond to this truth the same way we do every week with the most important action that we'll take today. And that is coming to the table to remember the foundation on which everything that we do is built. And that's the death and resurrection of Jesus. 
Through his grace and forgiveness, we've been forgiven, we've been made new, we've been given hope, and we've been given eternal life. Everything that we do is a response to the faith that we have that has been given to us as a gift through the grace of God. Our faith in Jesus is what fuels everything that we do. And so this morning, as I pray, would you come with me as we respond in worship to the truth of who God is and the truth of where he has led us as a congregation. God, we thank you for today in your word. We thank you that you have given us uh, a calling, a vision, a picture of who you want us to be, Uh, not just this year, but in, in all of the years to come. God, help us to be a people who move towards you. Help us be a people whose lives are shaped by you more than they are anything else. Increase our love for you and our love for one another, and help us to be a people that are defined by your grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.